Stephen Gray Ministries. Well, this morning I want to share a message with you entitled, Do I Have a Healthy Appetite for God? When y'all got up this morning, how many of you had breakfast? A big one. Okay, good. Now, I want, to, I want you to finish this statement. I had breakfast this morning because... I was hungry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Notice what he did say. He didn't say, I had breakfast because other people in the room, I wanted to be sociable. He didn't say, I, I wanted to have breakfast because I didn't want to offend somebody. He said, I had breakfast because I was hungry. And that is a base need that God has put within our bodies to keep us healthy. That we would desire food to eat so that we would grow and mature and, and be strengthened. And guess what? God does the same thing with our spiritual condition. And so I want to share some things with you that God has shown me. And, you know, I had a wonderful uh, break a few months ago. And it was a whole new vista to have quiet time for me, not for a message or anything of that nature. And I was going through the Beatitudes and God started showing me some things. And I want to take you to the beginning of the Beatitudes with Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, where Jesus is actually begins to teach his disciples. And he's, you know, really this is probably the first or one of the first messages he teaches. Uh, maybe the first message was when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But now he's going into a teaching and he's talking about kingdom life. He's talking about how to be a disciple. And the first thing he says are, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. One of the things that prevents our hunger for God is idolatry in our lives. But that's a big subject because you can have all kinds of different idols. And we even have some idols that we don't even know we have. But what does that mean, you know, to have idolatry? And look what it says here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, okay? So these first three beatitudes we're going to look at today are preparing you for something that's coming. All right? And I want to show you this. The first beatitude, of course, is blessed are the poor in spirit. The word poor here means poor such as a beggar begging for alms, someone destitute in wealth, or de desperate for true eternal righteousness. Is anybody listening? That's what the word in the Greek means. Desperate for true eternal righteousness. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. To realize you have a need for eternal righteousness. I like that word. Psychologists call this need in us a search for significance. There have been books written about it where we all have a desire to find our meaning, our purpose, our value. And so right here in this first beatitude, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, those that recognize they have a need for something. Okay, and then he goes into the second one. He says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn what? Mourn over the condition of their spirits, that they are desperate, they are desolate. And so many of us think that when we got saved, that we got eternal life, but we missed the big picture. And this is what Paul's doing a lot of teaching in Romans about. We've missed the big picture of our need for righteousness which God has put in you to mourn over your condition. The ignorance of what God has done for you, not understanding you have this need and not knowing what God has done to fill that need. And then the second word of the third beatitude in verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And simply put, meek means to be humble or to accept God's dealings without disputing or resisting. I'm glad I've never done that. 
That's a joke. Because I think, how many of you complained or wrung your hands or, God, why is this happening? And I want you to know, everything going on in your life and mine is happening for a reason. That reason may be you caused it or you opened that door to that demon. Or it may be that God's trying to bring something into you. And so I've, I've started to learn once you become born again that everything in my life is there because God's allowed it or caused it. So what do I need to learn from this, Lord? That's what I'm looking for. But it's pretty obvious what Christ is leading up to here as I, as I go through these Beatitudes. And, and he was opening this door and showing me this that day. And I was just going, wow, God, this is amazing. And then we come to verse 6. Drum roll, please. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. There it is. He's setting this whole first part of these Beatitudes is setting us up for a hunger and thirst, which I believe we already have. And so what he's saying is I'm giving you a promise that you will be filled if you really hunger and thirst for this. I will meet your need. I will fill you. I will show you. I will reveal it to you. He will have mercy on us. And that's what he says in Romans 4.25 when he says he was raised for our justification. This is almost a prophetic declaration of why I'm going to go to the cross. So that your eternal thirst for righteousness will be filled. Amen. And we think, oh, it's just so I can get my golden ticket and wait for the bus to come. No, that's a, that's a distorted picture of salvation. It's probably more so because, see, God didn't just save you so you wouldn't go to hell. He saved you for a relationship. But you can't be in relationship with a holy God. So he has to fix that, and he does it by making you righteous. And man so struggles. People get offended. People get their feelings hurt. We've had people leave this church because they got upset or mad because they weren't recognized or, or they thought they were being insulted or something. I've had, you know how many people come up to me and says, I know you were looking at me Sunday. <laughs> I know you were preaching to me. And I said, guess what? Don't take this the wrong way. But I don't preach to anybody. I just, here's what God's telling me to say. So if it hits you, it's because God's doing it, not me. So don't blame me. So let's just say it this way. So God didn't just want to forgive me. That's what we read in the Prince of Spiritual Discipline. He wants me to know I'm, He's made me righteous. But that it's not an easy thing to swallow at first. We struggle with that. We know from Romans chapter 10, this should almost be a banner over our church or a placard. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, did what? Went out to try to establish their own. And that's what we're all trying to do. That's why people get offended. That's why people get their feelings hurt. That's why people separate is their values being affected by somebody. Well, you know what that means? It doesn't mean that person's bad or wrong or you're bad or wrong. It just means you haven't accepted God's righteousness. That's what it means. That's what the rest of the verse says. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. We've talked in here before about how powerful identity is. What I do comes out of what I believe. If I believe I'm unrighteous, guess what? I'll do unrighteous things. If I, but if I believe I'm righteous, then I will have a hard time doing unrighteous things. If I believe I'm, I'm sinless, I believe God's forgiven me, then I'll have a hard time walking in guilt. If I believe 
Your belief is powerful, and our belief systems are, are seated in our subconscious. But, you know, God has given us these powerful indicators called hunger and thirsting for righteousness. And so if that's not there, then we can't hunger for God. So how do I know, you know, how is your hunger for God? You know, many times we first get saved and we're on fire. You know why? Because when babies are born, they're, they're crying because they're hungry. You don't have to tell them, teach them how to eat. They're, they're, they're trying to eat. They want to eat. And they'll eat almost 24-7 if you keep feeding them. And we're the same way spiritually until we let idols get in our life. And we say, well, what are those idols? And you, we think of boats and cars and other things. Houses, jobs. But guess what? That's not the worst idol we can have. There are four things I want to give you today that God showed me about how do we restore our righteousness and find our hunger for God. There are four things I want you to look at. The first one is a desire for truth. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 28. And we see really so much of what's going on in the world today and even what we struggle with. It's t verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness. What's a, what's a, what's a debased mind? One that's worthless, has no real value, because, see, they feel they're unrighteous. And that's where the world is. They don't know they're righteous because most of them not if they're not born again because they haven't received what Christ has done. So we have to have a desire for truth. You see, the first three Beatitudes in this passage is dealing with our need. That Christ is preparing us to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do to take advantage of this. You're desperately in need of a new identity. And God's always showing us this. Old friends you used to have, old people, neighbors, acquaintances that, that are not walking with the Lord will fade away from your life. Why? Because you're following Jesus and they're not. <laughs> it's pretty simple. And sometimes we think, oh, you know, maybe we need to pull back or withdraw. The second beatitude about, and then you mourn. You see, spiritual need is grieving over your condition. Oh God, I see this need. I see this problem. But God, I want to be meek so that I can receive what you've done. I don't want to establish my own value. You know how hard that is for us that's grown up in a society and culture that says your value is determined by what you can do? If you perform well, you're good. If you perform bad, you're bad. And that is a terrible burden to carry through your life. Control is prideful. And humility is a yielding to God. This is the truth you have to have. You have to, you have to say, God, I want truth no matter the cost. No matter what I have to do, I want your truth. And here's the thing, but be ready when you ask for truth, that you have to change. You can't receive God's truth and go, nah, I don't think so. I'm going to keep doing it the way I've been doing it. And there's a lot of people that are in that place. See, we don't know how to handle truth. And so you know what we do? We just decide we don't want to get truth. It's too, it creates too much of a, of a, of a paradox in our lives. Because, man, when I hear truth, i got to do what God says. And, and that's good for a while, but all of a sudden, we start feeling like we're, we're backing away. Why? 
because you've never accepted your value. You've never accepted your value. We talked before in Romans uh, the other night. We were talking about how Romans 3 and 5 is talking about salvation and justification. And then Romans 8 and 12 chapters is talking about living the spirit-led life. But in the middle of that is chapter 6 and 7, which is about identification principles. Meaning you died with Christ. I asked the Lord one time, I said, Lord, why is death so important? Death to self. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute. Why is death to self so important? He says, until you die or until you get your identity, until you get your value settled, you will never be able to die to self. Because you're so busy trying to find value. And God says, well, hey, do this. I'm busy, God. I'm trying to get, feel good about what I'm doing here. So we get distracted. And it's really hard. But once I settle the fact that I, I, I am valuable, that I have God's righteousness, it doesn't matter if I feel it, I've got it. I remember one time I was casting a spirit of unrighteousness off of someone and that spirit left and they fell back in their seat and they said, wow, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> That's a natural response to this issue. So we have to have a desire for truth. Number two, we have to remove our idols. We have to deal with the idols in our life. Sometimes for pastors, it can be the church. It does, it's, not, it's not the bad idols. I don't have a problem getting rid of those. It's the good idols. Putting family members above before God. I had someone call me this week who's having marital problems and said, God told me if I didn't put him first, he'd take my wife. I'm not sure that was really God, but that's what he came up with. But, you know, the, the principle works. God will take... Anything that's in the way of you and him. Look at this thing in eternal perspective. God's after you in a most desperate, passionate way. What is the greatest threat to our soul? Whatever keeps you from God. Whatever keeps you from God. And I believe not every thread is necessarily a sin. It's just getting in the way. Or maybe we don't see it as sin. I remember when I went to Africa the first time and I saw God do all these miracles and I went, wait a minute, they told me in church that all this stuff didn't happen today. And I said, man, they lied to me. And... I was on the plane coming home and I was like, God, what, what's the deal here? I mean, Acts is alive and well. And I said, why are we not seeing this in America? I was very specific. Why are we not seeing these miracles like this in America? And here's what the Lord spoke to me. I, it was like he was in the seat behind me. I heard it so clearly. Isaiah 29, 13. Therefore, the Lord said, then as much as these people... Draw near with their mouths. They talk a good game. And honor me with their lips. So they, they worship, but they have removed their hearts far from me. That's an idol. That's an idol. And their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Meaning they're more concerned about what man says and what the rules are than they are about their relationship with God. And some of the most judgmental and critical in the Jewish race is an example of this. Almost every Jew that I've met over the years has a problem with intimacy. It's something within that race. You know why? Because they're so performance oriented and they're so low in their value and understanding of Christ, unless they become messianic and believers. And so they have to be performers. They have to be 
they have to keep up with their perfection they think they're seeking. Their hearts are far from me, that verse says. Religion and self separates you from God. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says your flesh, your will is an idol. Proverbs 29, 25 says the fear of man is a snare. The fear of man is a snare. That's one of the hardest things when you're pastor in a church is to not preach what people want to hear, but preach what God says. I, I had a guy one time who was coming here and said, you're preaching too much about righteousness. I'm like, how can you say that? I said, first of all, I'm preaching what God's telling me, which he, I don't know whether he believed that or not, but he said, but you're preaching too much about righteousness. And you know what this guy needed? The one thing in his life, he, the greatest need he had was righteousness. So where do you think that was coming from? I won't answer that. Luke chapter 9. Verse 59. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And what he meant, what that means in the Hebrew was, or in the Jewish uh, culture, is let me go back and wait till my father dies. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. The glory left Israel over idolatry. Ezekiel 8.3 talks about the sin of idolatry as what causes the glory to live. Number three, so there was desire for truth. Idolatry is number two. Number three is entering the abundant life. This will restore your hunger and your hunger for righteousness and your hunger for God. Romans 6.14 tells us. Romans for 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Whenever you see the word grace, that means the Spirit is directing you. If you're directed by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Romans 8, 5, set your mind on what the Spirit desires. That's how Paul says you walk in the Spirit-led life. John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from God's leading, you can do nothing. Romans 8, 11 through 14 talks about life by the Spirit. Life is by the Spirit. So if you're not obeying the Holy Spirit, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a dryness in your life. I'll always see the Holy Spirit as like the rain of His presence on us. And when that rain is coming down, you're going to stay wet. You're going to stay nurtured. Number four, and lastly, is applying the blood of Jesus. You may be surprised by that one. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about repentance. Learning how to live as a priest. Because the Bible says in the New Testament, in 1 Peter, you are a priest. You're a royal priest meaning you're a priest to God. Knowing that you're forgiven, but also knowing why and what repentance is. And I, I want to tell you a story just recently that happened. Someone came to me and said, I'm having a problem with this sin. And I said, I guess I need to repent. And I said, well, he said, but I'm afraid I'll keep doing it. And I said, well, then you don't need to repent. You're not ready for repentance. You need to be in confession. 
because the word confess means to agree with God. So I said, let's don't pray a prayer of repentance. Let's pray a prayer of confession. God, help me to agree with you about this sin that I'm doing. Help me to say, God, this is wrong. I agree with you. And when you come into agreement, you'll be able to repent. It worked. And it worked. <laughs> Proof is in the pudding. And then they, they came excited and they're describing the power of God that came into their life when they did repent. That, that's something as pastors and ministers, we've made the mistake of, oh, just repent like it's a magic word. No, it isn't. You have to understand what that really means. Because when you t literally turn to what God is telling you to do, you're empowered. You get the power of the Spirit. And you can do anything when you've got the power of the Spirit. Understanding the blood. Understanding the power of the blood. You people say, well, I don't feel forgiven. It doesn't matter what you feel because the blood was first for God. God said, this is what it will require to forgive sin. So Jesus said, I'll pay it. And so God's in the priest, when he would go behind the veil, no one could see that sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat. You know why? Because the blood is only for God. He decided that's what it would cost to redeem you. And so the blood is for God. But guess what? The blood is also towards you. You know why? Because Hebrews tells us, and I think it's 914, that the blood cleanses my conscience. The blood cleanses my conscience. Because of the blood of Jesus, I don't need to feel guilt if I've done something. If you feel guilt, it's from the devil or from your ignorance of the blood. But see, I know the verse and I know just, I just said, no, -uh, guilt, you cannot come in here because I know the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. Amen. So get out of here in the name of Jesus. And then finally, the blood is for Satan because it's removed his right of accusation. And that's Revelations 12, 11, I think. Yeah, 12, 11. So that means if I'm hearing an accusing spirit, guess what? No, the blood has removed you. Amen. You can't speak to me. Because of, not because I deserve it or I've done something wrong or done something good. Because Jesus' blood removed your right of accusation. When you know that fact, he can't talk to you. But if you're sitting there going, wait just a minute, hold on, hold that thought, demon. Uh, let's see. I know it's in here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. You're in trouble. They overcame him by the blood and their testimony. That's what the Bible says. So those four things, desiring the truth, removing the idols, and the biggest idol we have is self. Self-idolatry. Self-idolatry. And that just means where I have, just like the verse we read in Romans 10, 3, and seeking to establish what? Your own righteousness. You've exalted self. When you say, well, I don't, Believe that you're exalting self. It don't matter what you believe because Christ has declared it and done it. It's truth. Does it, you can't exalt self and say, well, I don't believe that or I don't, this said, I don't agree with that's truth. Uh, who cares if you don't agree? I don't change it. We allow self to come up and take a position. We have to understand that self is removed when I realize I've been made righteous. And Christ has crucified self.
But guess what? If I don't know, if I still struggle with my identity, I cannot accept my crucifixion. I can't accept it. I can't accept my identity if I've refused to accept my righteousness. That's why Je- that's the first thing Jesus brought. This is the first teaching he sat down with his disciples, said, You got to get this, guys. And blessed are those who are so poor in spirit that they know they got to have Christ's righteousness. There is no good thing in you. Someone complimented me one time and and they said, well, you don't seem too excited. I just complimented you. And I said, look, here's what I've realized. Anything good I do is God. Anything bad I do is me. So what do I need to be prideful about? Jesus is talking here about a kingdom principle because he's got a kingdom mandate. And this is something I want to share with you that he showed me. What happens when you refuse these truths? Okay, what happens when you refuse these truths? You have to understand what he is saying here and that he is trying to bring us into kingdom life. So when you say, no, God, I'm not going to accept what you've done on the cross. I'm going to do I'm going to do things to prove I'm valuable. I'm going to go and help people. I'm going to give money away because I feel good. And so you're refusing the kingdom mandate is what's happening. Now, where is the kingdom? Where is the kingdom? It's within us. So if I'm going to build a kingdom, what am I going to be doing? Building the kingdom in people, correct? Correct. Well, here's the other thing I want you to realize. In the kingdom, you can't teach with an anointing until you believe it. You can't teach with an anointing until you believe it. And then you live it. When you you, you live it and believe it, then you can teach it with an anointing. You ever watch preachers on TV or on even in church and, they, and you say, man, that guy, that's not very anointed. You know why? Because they either don't believe it or they're not living it. What problems do you see in your own life that has caused you to not build the kingdom? Well, I'm doing some things, but what about the things you're not doing? What things do you need to change to build the kingdom more efficiently? I want you to turn your Bibles. I want to teach you this principle as God showed it to me in Matthew chapter 13. I mean, this this just kind of set my revelation on fire. Jesus is talking to the disciples This is obviously a little further down. He's actually talking about the parables, okay? Now, let me explain to you what's happened with parables, just in case you've forgotten. Is Jesus rejects, or Israel rejects Jesus as the king. And so Israel, the nation, most of the people, reject the kingdom that Jesus was bringing. Okay, the kingdom that's within, he was building in those 12 disciples and was going to build in others. They built in others. Uh, the Hebrews rejected that kingdom. All right? So now Jesus is answering them in verse 11. Here's what he says. Listen to this. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. It's been given to you, Christian, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. This statement is being said to those disciples, but it applies to each of us today. It applies to you sitting here listening to this message this morning. Because it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. He's getting ready to tell you one of them. But to them, meaning Israel, it has not been given. For they've rejected the king. You can't have the kingdom without the king. Look verse 12. For whoever has, to him more will be given. He's talking about the kingdom receiving it, living in it. And he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. 
All right, therefore I speak to them in parables. Now he's primarily talking about Israel right now because, but then here's the principle that's going to relate to us. Because seeing they do not see, and I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. Because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. Nor do they understand. And in the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, this is verse 14, which says, hearing you, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, for their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their ears, see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. How would he heal them? By bringing them into the kingdom. So here's what Jesus is saying. If you're rejecting or ignoring the kingdom mandate to know your value and your righteousness, you are literally saying to Jesus, I'm not living in your kingdom. And he's looking at you and saying, then you will neither see nor hear the way you should. So the Lord spoke to me. He said, start praying for the church that they will begin to see and they will begin to hear. They will repent. They will receive the truth of their value. They will accept the righteousness and they will begin to live under the kingdom mandate. And all the blessings of heaven will be poured out upon you. All the presence, all the fullness all the glory, all the power. We've talked before about people come in here and they, they hear, they hear, but they don't see. They don't really hear. We say they don't get it. Here's why they don't get it. Because their eyes and their ears have been blocked. I felt like God said, this is the key we've been looking for of why people can't receive God's real truth in the church today. So I should start repenting of what, wherever I'm at with this, whatever I feel like in my identity, that's the first place because God's going to build the kingdom in here first, and then as this is built in here, then you can start building it in others. So probably it's going to start here. And so it's as simple as saying, God, I repent for not accepting my, your, my righteousness. God, I see that I've, I've worried about things and I've done things and I've been more concerned about how I look to people than I have with what you think. And so, God, I'm trying to find my value from man. And, I, and to be honest with you, I think all of us have been affected by this to some degree. And all I got to do is say, God, I repent and I see now what you're saying. And so now open my eyes and my ears. I remember years and years ago, a, a, pre, a missionary came to our church. It was a Baptist church. A missionary came to the church and he, he, he taught a seminar uh, during the week on the normal Christian life. And they handed out the books, and I'm sitting there looking at the book, and he's teaching. And, and I'm sitting there looking, and, and if you read the book, it's very simple. But I couldn't get it. <laughs> it was like he might as well speak in Spanish or Greek or something. I couldn't get it. And I, I, and I kept looking at it, and I, I went home, and I was kind of discouraged. I said, God, I'm not stupid, and this is simple stuff. Why can't I get this? God, I repent. Help me get this. And the next day I went into that meeting and it was just like we were speaking the same language. It's like, wow, I started seeing it. And I thought, what blocked me? This is what God is saying. You see, we've lived outside the kingdom for so long, we, we don't know what it feels like. And you know, here's what it starts with, 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 I believe, what Jesus said. By accepting God has made you righteous. Well, I don't feel righteous. It don't matter how you feel. Truth is truth. God, I repent for not accepting my righteousness because I realize it is a principle. 
I repent for trying to worry about this or worry about that or, or find it here or find it there. And I accept that truth today. God says, give them. Here's four areas of how to progress now. How do we, how do we move forward in this revelation? Four areas of progress. Number one, prayer. We can always change things by beginning with prayer. Praying for something means we really want to change it. When I got this first revelation of this in my quiet time, my, my how to apply it was I will begin to pray for myself and the church to begin to see and hear what I haven't seen or heard before. And you know what's, that was, that was about a, a month or two ago. And you know what's starting to happen? All these people are starting to get deliverances of stuff. And I didn't realize what it was. I thought God was just had a sale going on or something. We've had people had, Blenda shared what shared hers. People have major deliverances and some are going through major deliverances. And as I believe it's because of this prayer. All we got to do is say, God, I repent of not seeing and hearing. And I want to change. See the prayer as the beginning of change and the beginning of a new life. And journal it. Write out what God's saying to you about it until you see the changes in your life. Understand that prayer is seeking and praying God's will. Understand that prayer is seeking and praying God's will. So my first prayer might be, Lord, Help me to know how to pray for the kingdom. Help me to know how to pray about my righteousness. Help me to know how to pray that, to, uh, that I'm entering in. Because that is a prayer that God's going to answer. And it may be a different answer for you than it is for me. And begin to build my life, God. Begin to, on, on the basic principles of your kingdom. Don't ever feel frustrated or condemned. Don't ever feel frustrated or condemned because we're all on the path into His kingdom. You can never say, well, I'm glad I've arrived because we ain't ever arriving. <laughs> we're always moving forward into greater and greater enlightenment and understanding. God has given us, He's shown us and given us prayer to change us not change God. We're not trying to get God to do something that He doesn't want to do. We're trying to find out what He wants to do. This is what He wants to do. He's saying the same thing to us He said to those men 2,000 years ago. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to pray with a new understanding. Number two is worship. Worship is the door to access with God. Worship helps me focus on God and His will. So if you're just sitting there and start praying in your quiet time or whatever, you need to have some worship first because worship brings you into a focus on God. God will often speak in the worship. He'll say, I want you to pray this or I want you to repent for that. Worship is a way of taking your mind off the wind and the waves. Worship takes our mind off the problem and puts it right smack on God. It's important that one of your prayers says, God, change my mind about your kingdom. If I haven't seen and I haven't heard, then show me what I need to see and help me hear what I need to hear. And I'm going to tell you, God's going to answer that prayer. Number three, communion. I'm not talking about the Lord's Supper. I'm talking about spending time with God. Ask yourself this question this morning. Am I spending enough time with God alone? And whatever answer you get will be a good indicator of what you need to work on. If you're like me, Usually when I ask that question, God says, no, 
<laughs> so he doesn't say, start spending six hours a day with me. He usually says, can you give me 10 minutes in the morning? Can you give me five minutes in the afternoon? Sometimes we think that worship and prayer is about getting God to act. But in fact, it's about changing my mind and learning what God wants to do. Sometimes he just wants to sit with you, enjoy you. Do you know God enjoys you? You know, I, I've, sometimes I'll get busy and maybe a couple of days where I'll have, a, I'll, I'll have just a really good soaking time. And so I'll get in. The, I'll say, okay, God, I got to get back in. So I'll start sitting and sitting down with God. You know, the first thing God usually says, I missed you. I said, well, God, I've been right here. I know. But I missed our time where we just sit and soak. And we're not trying to get a message or get a word. We're just enjoying one another. God wants to sit. He wants to enjoy us. Is God enjoying you? Is there, are you giving him time to enjoy you? Understand that when you're spending time in prayer and worship, you're already accomplishing a kingdom act. You're building the relationship with the king. This is your first step anyway, so enjoy this time. Don't see it as something you're doing to get something. See it as this is, this is the change in your life you can make that I know that I know that I know what I need to do. Do you enjoy spending time with God? Or you use one of those people that sit down and say, I have a hard time sitting still. You don't know how many times I've heard that. I'd rather be up doing something. Guess what? You're getting your value. Or you got a spirit on you that wants you to keep performing. If you struggle with spending time with God, list the reasons why. You struggle with it. And God will start to reveal things to you. Lastly, number four of how to progress is repentance. And that's how I want to close this morning. That's the good news of the power of repentance. Man, when God shows us something, it's like, oh, Lord, thank God I can repent. <laughs> thank God when I repent, 10 seconds later, God goes, what are you talking about? You see, the Bible says God chooses not to remember our sin. So the moment I repent, it's like it's gone. Disappeared. Lord, I come to you today to repent for not seeing and hearing the command to enter the kingdom of God through my actions. I can repent right now today. Let's pray. Lord, I repent today for not seeing and hearing the command to enter the kingdom of God through my actions. Lord, I, as I repent, I ask you to open my eyes and my ears, and I speak for everyone in this church, to see and hear what you are saying to me today. Doesn't matter what the preacher says. It doesn't matter what someone else says. It only matters, God, what are you saying to me today? God, I repent for not hearing and seeing. Open my eyes and open my ears to hear what you have to say to me. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the followers of Christ to hear and see the importance and need to be a kingdom citizen in this hour. To be a kingdom citizen in this hour. God, I thank you so much that when you died on the cross and you were raised from the dead and you were justified by the Father and you became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And Lord, I repent for not seeing this, for not understanding this. Lord, would you open my eyes for a greater revelation of your righteousness in my life. In the mighty and precious name, we pray, amen.